Okay, well, welcome back. I told you last time that uh, in this module we're going to have a very special treat, something really special for me, uh, to talk with Professor Irving Gottesman. Um, to be honest, uh, Irv's office is just, I think, two down the hallway from my own, so I do get to talk with him quite a bit. But what's really special for me is uh, you've had to sit through eight weeks of getting my perspective on the field, and I think it would be really nice to get someone else's, a real giant in the field, perspective on this field of behavioral genetics. Uh, Irv is, uh, I don't want to embarrass him <laughs> at the beginning here, but Irv is really one of the preeminent, if not the preeminent, behavioral geneticists in the world. Um, I just want to make, I, if I tried to summarize his uh, resume, his CV, I, we would take all our time just doing that. So I just want to make two points. One is Irv got his PhD a few years ago from the University of Minnesota. Um, and it really shows what, that this was a very forward-looking uh, uh, institution back then. Secondly, a scientist at the end of his or her career would, loves to get lifetime achievements from the associations that they've participated in and contributed in. I looked through Irv's CV this morning, and I counted, and I might have counted off Irv, but I counted 10 different lifetime achievements from 10 different organizations. He really is one of the most celebrated behavioral geneticists in the world. So thanks for coming and, and sharing your thoughts with the students here today. Um, the first thing I wanted to, to start with is something that we touched on very early in the course. Um, we began the course with uh, the history, mm -hmm. the early history mm -hmm. of the field and Galt, and of course you weren't around then. Um, <laughs> Galton and the and how behavioral genetics was really probably discredited by the eugenics movement, but it reemerged in the 60s and the 70s. And you were there then. You were a young researcher at that time. Uh, you did your dissertation here in 1960 on the genetics of personality, which really what must have just I don't even know how you sold that to your advisors. And I, I guess it would be very interesting to get your perspective on how it is that psychology began to come back to behavioral genetics in the 60s and 70s, and what it was like for pioneers like you at that time. I didn't know that I was a pioneer until much later, but I was very lucky that I chose the U of M for my graduate training. Mm -hmm. uh, I came here on the GI Bill, now you may not know that, mm -hmm. no. uh, after having served in the Korean War as a naval officer. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that long period of time at sea, I read Psycho psychology and psychiatry journals. And I came to the conclusion that there was no better place than Minnesota for learning about clinical psychology. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the first graduates of the child clinical psychology program. Mm -hmm. But early in my education here, which began in actually in 1956, mm -hmm. so in the middle of the last century, mm -hmm. I was very fortunate in taking a course in individual differences. And that changed my whole life and my perspective about clinical psychology and psychology in general. And that course, which was then a two-quarter course, was taught by D.G. Patterson, another yeah. Yeah. Uh, icon of Minnesota psychology, and Jim Jenkins, another icon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And during that course, I read about twin studies of schizophrenia and other kinds of mental illness. Okay. And I thought, gee, it would really be cool if someday I could pull off something like that but do it so as to avoid the criticisms that have been leveled. And the criticisms that were leveled often came from people who uh, were well-intentioned, but they thought that genetics and psychology together uh, was some kind of a fascist mm -hmm. plot. Mm -hmm. And this came about because of the way the Nazis had bastardized human genetics during that period of time from 1933 to 1945. Mm -hmm. And it was very difficult to undo what they had done. Was it hard for you to sell your dissertation topic to your Ph.D. committee? The Ph.D. committee was hand-picked by my uh, oh. advisor. My dissertation advisor was Sheldon Reed, oh, whom really? we can talk about a little bit. Mm -hmm. But Sheldon Reed uh, decided that he needed a psychologist who could get interested in genetics. He himself was a fruit fly, Drosophila geneticist, mm -hmm. but he was interested in some of the behavioral aspects of the fly's behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was introduced to me, and vice versa, by D.G. Patterson, who was also a member of the American Civil Liberties Union. You can see that yeah. Minnesota ideas about genetics were very uh, liberal mm -hmm. and open-minded. Mm -hmm. And when I got together with Sheldon Reed, he said, we really need a twin study. And because the MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, had been invented here, 
it would be interesting if somebody could do a twin study of normal twins using a good personality inventory like mm -hmm. the MMPI. And that launched me. So in 1957, I started chasing around to the superintendents of schools here in the Twin Cities and learned that there were 31,000 children in grades 9 through 12. Mm -hmm. And with the help of the secretaries at the various junior highs and mm -hmm. high schools here, I was able to find all those students who had the same last name and the same birth date. Oh. That well, that's a lot of work for a graduate student. Oh, you haven't heard <laughs> the rest of it. I was a one-man show in that time, and yeah. I was also married and raising a child. Yeah. Out of those 31,000 kids, we found 68, I found 68 pairs of twins, mm -hmm. identical and fraternal, yeah. same-sex fraternals. Yeah, yeah. And then I began the chore of trying to convince them and their parents to sign off on doing the MMPI and another test by factor analytically derived test mm -hmm. as a backup. And uh, we lost some people that way, mm -hmm. and uh, 68 pairs survived. And then I started to collect them on Saturdays to come to various churches, YMCAs, mm -hmm. what have you, mm -hmm. libraries, uh, to sit down and take the test. I also had to convince them that I could get some blood out of them. So I was one of the very first psychologists oh. to try to do zygosity with the uh, blood group markers. Blood group markers. Yeah. That would have been very, yeah, very yeah. forward thinking back <laughs> in 1957. Always. And I did all this without any external funding, just by my mm -hmm. charm and personality. Mm -hmm. And I convinced the Minneapolis War Memorial Blood Bank that this would be a good opportunity for them to find rare blood types. And they saw the advantage right away. Mm -hmm. They did all the blood grouping mm -hmm. for free. Mm -hmm. In Was addition, <laughs> And one more aspect yeah, yeah. that's different. Uh -huh. I took fingerprints from all these kids. Yeah. And I learned to do fingerprinting from the uh, Minnesota C Criminal Apprehension Bureau. Oh. <laughs> and so I took their fingerprints, I drove them to the blood bank, talked to their parents, mm. talked to them, and then I took their photographs. Mm. So later on I could use their photographs to see whether or not some uh, layman could tell the difference between identical and fraternal twins mm -hmm. just by looking at their faces. So I had my hands full and it took me three years to do the dissertation. Wow. What was the impact of that? Again, this would have been the, the first study in the U.S. for sure of uh, behavioral genetic studies of personality. What, what do you think the impact of that initial study was back? I think you published it in 1960? That, or that was the dissertation that yeah. you published it a few years after that? I published the results in 1963, and that has an interesting story by itself that fits in with your discussion. Mm -hmm. I sent the uh, write-up of the dissertation in uh, to an editor, famous editor, whom I won't mention by name. He rejected it out of hand without sending it out for review on the grounds that the nature-nurture question had been settled in the 1920s, mm. and there was no need to revisit those issues. Mm. When my dissertation advisors here learned of that, they were even more angry than I. Mm. And they said, we're going to write a letter to that editor and get this re-reviewed. They sent their opinion. They were high-powered people, as you could imagine. Yeah. And it was then sent out for review and accepted, okay. finally published in 1963. Yeah. I would say that the impact was uh, close to zero. Oh, interesting. <laughs> uh, at, at that, the first uh, textbook in behavior genetics had not been published until 1960 by Fuller and Thompson. Mm -hmm. And so my dissertation came out a little bit too late to be mentioned there, mm -hmm. although it was then mentioned pretty much regularly in uh, introductory textbooks mm -hmm. of psychology, abnormal psychology, child development. And uh, I would say probably by about 1970, Mm -hmm. About 10 years after I finished the dissertation, it then began to be noticed nice. and to be cited. That you also then, after you did your dissertation, I think you must have gone and done a postdoc over in the University of London, is it? Maudsley, is that the at university? The, it's the Institute of Psychiatry, right. at the, and the Maudsley Hospital is based at the Institute of Psychiatry yeah. in London. Mm -hmm. And now it's part of King's College King's London. College, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, um, and not only, of course, did you do the pioneer, pioneering studies in the genetics of personality, but you probably did the landmark 
and I'm not just saying this because you're yes. a friend, or, but you did the landmark twin study of schizophrenia, and I, th I think it still stands today as, as the most important twin study of schizophrenia. And, and it'd be interesting <coughs> to hear how <coughs> that was received in the field, because it really did change people's thinking about schizophrenia, did it yeah. not? It was quite uh, contentious to get involved in that area. And uh, again, one of my goals, as I mentioned earlier, was to use my dissertation as a jumping board. But in between the dissertation and going to London and my postdoc, I replicated my Minnesota study during the time that I was on the faculty at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And that convinced me again that this was not a bad area. I was in this rut, mm -hmm. and I've been in that rut ever since. Mm -hmm. While I was at the Mosley, <clears throat> I was fortunate to come under the uh, guidance of Elliot Slater. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we'll psychiatrist. A, he's a psychiatrist. Yeah. I was very lucky that his brother was a stat statistician and trained oh, as a psychologist. Oh. Yeah. So he opened the uh, doors to this gold mine mm -hmm. of consecutive admissions to the Maudsley Hospital over a 16-year period of time. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to reconnect with those twins who had been admitted as patients and track down their co-twins, whether they were living in Australia or Ireland or wherever. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, try to get them to be interviewed, to have blood drawn if it had not yet been drawn, and to talk to me in a tape-recorded interview. Mm -hmm. uh, people at the Maudsley said, no, no English twin is going to, or no English citizen <laughs> is going to sit still while you do a tape-recorded psychiatric interview. Uh, I showed them that they were wrong. They also willingly took the MMPI, and I was then in the gold mine again. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the criticisms that had been made of the earlier twin studies and why they were not uh, credible across the whole field of mm -hmm. psychology and psychiatry was that the individuals who did the study also did the diagnosis of zygosity okay, so and the was diagnosis. A there, there was a, an assumed yeah. bias. Yeah, that was the presumption. Yeah. And in the work that I did, and I was lucky then to have a partner, James Shields, mm -hmm. uh, who had a fantastic career, first of all, as a prisoner of war in Germany. He was captured on the first day of the invasion in Europe. Mm. And later on, after he'd been released, he was one of the last adults to contract polio. Oh. So he had had a rough time. And he was Slater's research assistant. Mm -hmm. Slater paired us two of us up. <clears throat> and I was James Shields' legs, mm -hmm. and he was my computer mm -hmm. archive. He had been through these 16 years of twin collection at the Maudsley. Mm -hmm. I chased these twins down. I collected the information that we needed. Mm -hmm. And then instead of doing the diagnosis of their psychopathology, mm -hmm. the proband, as we called him, or her, and the co-twin, we decided that we would submit case histories that were blindfolded in regard to zygosity. Mm -hmm. We submitted these case histories to a panel of six judges who were composed of psychologists and psychiatrists who had had a lot of experience experts with in diagnosis. Eh? Diagnosis experts, yeah. right. This is before the DSM. This is before, the, well, there was a, there some was kind a DSM, of DSM. It yeah. It wasn't uh, mm -hmm. anything that we use. Mm -hmm. And we had world famous people who had themselves done twin studies, like Slater, like Essen Muller in mm -hmm. Sweden, uh, a Danish psychiatrist. Uh, some psychiatrists who were anti-genetics. We wanted to get opposition views and show that even when somebody who didn't believe in genetics did the uh, diagnosis, we would still come out with something that was worth talking about. And so we had a, a credible twin study. We showed that without doubt uh, the concordance rate in identical twins, given that one was schizophrenic, was in the neighborhood of 50 percent. And given that one fraternal twin had s schizophrenia, the other one had it about uh, 10 percent or so of the time, and that generated a high heritability. Mm -hmm. And it was that notion of high heritability that encouraged other people to say this was uh, an avenue worth uh, pursuing. It, f it flew in the face of people who thought that you could convince the audience that people develop schizophrenia because of the way their mother raised them. Mm -hmm. And that was something that uh, made me sick to my stomach, to think that in addition to the burden of raising a child who developed schizophrenia, mm -hmm. that you could then be blamed for having 
produce schizophrenia mm -hmm. in that child mm -hmm. by the way you treated them. And by having a genetic orientation, which was not, of course, uh, a hereditarian view of mm -hmm. genetics, but one that made plenty of room for environmental input mm -hmm. whenever it was deserved, mm -hmm. then we had a theory mm -hmm. uh, which at the time was unique. We published that idea in 1967 in the, in the uh, highly regarded PNAS. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll know that this is the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Yeah. And the person who put forward this theoretical idea, mm -hmm. or our ideas, with uh, Shields and I developed the polygenic theory mm -hmm. of schizophrenia. At that time, people who believed in a genetic component to schizophrenia had the idea that it was due to a single major locus, mm -hmm. either a dominant gene with incomplete penetrance or a pair of uh, recessive genes. And our theory competed with those ideas, and our theory was put forward into the PNAS by no less than Theodosius Dobzhansky, mm -hmm. again, a famous population geneticist, one of the most famous in the 20th century. Okay. So with that kind of backing, we were establishing a place for genetics within psychiatry and psychopathology. So what you started, it, one of the things we, we spent a, quite a bit of time on in this course is schizophrenia because from my perspective, it's really the prototypical psychiatric genetic phenotype. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've talked a lot about the research, the twin studies, and, and what you really initiated back in the 60s with the Maudsley twin study has really accelerated today in terms of how people think about schizophrenia. Uh, we're in the era of large-scale GWAS, um, let's find the genes. When you look at it at the field of schizophrenia genetics now, what do you think? Is it the progress you expected back 40 or 50 years ago when you started? Or are you disappointed? Um, do you think things are going well there? I'm certainly not disappointed. I okay. so, sort of feel like uh, I'm now a grandfather. Uh -huh. uh, my children, including you, mm -hmm. my intellectual children, uh, move the field forward. A lot of the work that uh, you and I did while we were at Washington University in St. Louis involved modeling. Mm -hmm. And modeling is remote from the biological the, aspects. The kind of the quantitative modeling. The quantitative mean. modeling, yeah. right. And those uh, notions uh, convince people who said, well, you're not into biology yet. And still, you're only talking about models. You're mm -hmm. talking about uh, goodness of fit. It's, it's all really the biology of the Exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And this was before anybody was thinking about actually looking at uh, genes or at SNPs mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. And that came along uh, a few decades later, not until yeah. about 1988 or so. Yeah. And I was uh, anticipating that something would happen, but that I would probably be dead by the time that came around. So I'm happy that I've lasted long <laughs> enough to see positive findings, even though nowadays, I mean, you think about back to my dissertation, I had 68 pairs of twins, and they were normals. If you were looking, that's okay, yeah. that's okay. And if you now realize that schizophrenia occurs in uh, eight out of a thousand people between the time they're born and the time they die, you need a large sample size in order to convince people using GWAS mm -hmm. that you have something. And nowadays, they're talking about samples of 10,000 or 12,000 individuals with twins and control groups of, what, 50,000 mm -hmm. that they get from blood banks and so forth. And with those kinds of contrasts, you can get statistically reliable results in regard to SNPs, but still SNPs are not genes. Mm -hmm. So you, we did talk about genome-wide association studies, GWASs, in this course. And there, as you know, there is a debate. On the one hand, there are those that feel that, okay, let's increase the sample sizes as large as we can make them, and we'll keep finding these genetic variants, but any given variant will have a small effect. And there are others that think that, well, our money might be spent better in other ways in, in trying to understand the, the biology of these disorders. Do you have a, a, a view on this particular debate? Do you think it's worthwhile to keep pursuing these effects of diminishing size with ever larger samples, or is it time for a shift? You don't have to say what that shift mm -hmm. would be, but yes. are, are, are we going to undergo another transformation, you think, in, in the way people approach these disorders? I'm encouraged by the increasing array of phenotypic and endophenotypic information mm -hmm. that's being collected. So at the time that, uh, I, that Shields and I began our work, 
we had no idea that brain imaging would come along or that it would produce mm -hmm. results. Say, if you were to do brain imaging in twins, mm -hmm. just think of the amount of information that's generated, mm -hmm. which then is there waiting to be tied to SNPs. Mm -hmm. In the near future, I would say in the next five to 10 years, I can see avoidance of this shotgun approach of looking at every single SNP. GWAS. That GWAS. Shotgun, yeah a shotgun on these uh, remarkable chips, and that this information will be filtered through the idea that the brain is organized into systems. Mm -hmm. And it's these brain systems which will give us the final steps toward understanding the biology of severe mental disorders. I think of the work that's been done so far, the analogy would be to uh, panning for gold dust in the uh, Sacramento River. Mm -hmm. And right now we're getting gold dust. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we'll be lucky enough somewhere around that area we'll find gold nuggets. nuggets okay. And eventually those gold nuggets will result in gold bars. Mm -hmm. And those gold bars are the genes that are actually involved in the neuropathology of schizophrenia. Not only the, the genes themselves, but those genes that control the genes. So that moves us into the field of epigenomics which is the near future. Okay. The, you mentioned the, the, the term uh, endophenotype, which is a term that Irv introduced into the field. And now, to confession here, Irv, I haven't mentioned the term endophenotype before, uh -huh. but I'll just give the students a gist of this. It's a very important idea, but I was kind of maybe waiting for you to come uh -huh. along to introduce it. So just to give the students an idea of what endophenotype is, uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but the notion is is that because things like what that we study, disorders like schizophrenia, or IQ or general cognitive ability are going to be remote from the primary gene products, proteins, that the, that we shouldn't necessarily expect large genetic effects there for any specific variant. And that's what we're finding in GWAS, of course. And the idea you introduced was the notion that what we should do is try to identify phenotypes that are intermediate between the primary gene products, the proteins, and the behavioral phenotypes we're studying and that that might magnify these genetic effects for us and help us better un, uh, identify the, the relevant genetic variants. And you call these intermediate phenotypes endophenotypes, right? Is that your, your definition is exactly oh, right. Oh, good. I'm not it's just in the ballpark. Perfect. You, <laughs> you again get an A+. Plus. Oh, thank you, Herb. Yes. <laughs> but there is some risk that people don't appreciate endophenotypes because they are aware of this idea of biomarkers. And biomarkers are very important. Biomarkers, however, can be things that aren't, uh, on the face of it, biological. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, personality test scores mm -hmm. or IQ test scores mm -hmm. or sub-tests mm -hmm. of those kinds of tests. Mm -hmm. Endophenotypes are themselves biomarkers, okay. but all biomarkers are not endophenotypes. Okay. Endophenotypes, for me, can be defined, at least at this stage of development, as characteristics that are not visible to the naked eye mm -hmm. or to the naked ear. Mm -hmm. They require some kind of processing, say with a PET scanner or with a brain scanner, uh, however you want to do your brain imaging, functional MRIs, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. They have to be heritable. And that means that there's still room for doing twin and family studies mm -hmm. using endophenotypes mm -hmm. because amongst all these biomarkers, there will be a subset that will pay off in put it pointing us toward the neurological, neurotransmitter systems that make the brain go awry. Mm -hmm. the, um, the, the, maybe the last question I'll ask you, or the last topic I'll touch on, mm -hmm. is so we're, we're coming to the end of the course, and the students probably have various motivations for taking a course like this, but hopefully some students have gone through the eight weeks and, and they're kind of intrigued and they're thinking, well, is this something I want to pursue further? And the question along those lines I have is, is behavioral genetics has really established that almost any behavioral trait is heritable? Is that something that's just going to get incorporated into psychology and behavioral genetics is, will, will go away? Or is there a real future to the, this field from your perspective? Is this something that is going to be there 20, 30 years from now? Is behavioral genetics still going to be an important part of psychology? Or have we made our point, it's an important point, 
and we should move on. You could have asked the same question a number of years ago about statistics. Uh -huh. And statistics are now taken for granted as being part of all uh, kinds of research in the, in the neurosciences, uh, however you want to, to look at them. And I see behavioral genetics as having the same fundamental uh, location mm -hmm. within the education of all people moving into uh, the sciences. Mm -hmm. And that means that we may not even talk about it as behavioral genetics. It'll just be incorporated with other fundamental courses. And hopefully it will be a required course uh, in the curriculum. It isn't yet. In uh, Minnesota, it almost is. It almost is. I teach the course yes. in behavioral genetics. Irv started in... 66. 66. Okay, yes. I'm teaching it now. Yeah, so. yeah. But uh, they didn't used to teach genetics in medical school. Yeah, that's right. And now it's a mandatory course. Mm -hmm. And it's the refinement of those kinds of things that will uh, last. Mm -hmm. I, I see this field as being so exciting. I wish I were 50 years younger so that I could be involved more actively in, in the kinds of uh, endophenotype research that is happening uh, as we speak. Yeah. I, I think that's really a good and positive note to, follow, uh, to, to end on. I, I agree with you. I think it's extraordinarily exciting time for people in this field. Um, and I do, I, you get an A plus for your answer because <laughs> I, I think of the, what, what genetics has to offer the psychologist is an extraordinary powerful set of tools for understanding behavior. And with, when that, those tools are gonna to be coupled with the developments in, in imaging and neuroscience, it's really gonna be a powerful force in our field. And I think you're right. I think it'll be more and more incorporated into the field. So I wanna thank you for coming over here today and talking with the students. And, and it, it's been a great time, Irv, so thanks a lot. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Okay, great, thanks. <laughs>